What do you got there, Rosalie? <laughs> <laughs> my arms are getting tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you not hear me? I know I couldn't hear you at all. Oh, yeah. now I was like, wow, this John, this uh, is John, uh, this up for a long time. For a while. Oh, that's funny. Well, that is a uh, floral water. It's what I've been drinking lately, and that's lilacs in there. So beautiful. So I just, I have so many lilacs, and I just clip them off and put them in cold water, and I just put that in the fridge like overnight, and then just pour them out and. It's this beautifully perfumed lilac flower yumminess. Very refreshing. I do it with all sorts of herbs all year long. And um, now we're in the season of violet or in violets, lilacs. So. <laughs> so hello, everybody. I am John Gallagher and this is Rosalie. I thought our names would be displaying on that. Let's play around. Uh, oh, no, I have to take away this other banner thing. Oh, we're just, you know, there, there we go. Now it'll show our go. name. Okay, That's hello. <laughs> John Gallier and Rosalie De La Forêt from Learning Herbs, and we're here for Herb Mentor Live, which is a just a very casual live thing Q and A for y'all. And you know, maybe Rosalie will share something. Um, and so, yeah, we're here. So this is a little uh, less scripted than other things that we do, but we just thought we would uh, come on here today. And uh, I, my my mouse doesn't seem to be working well here today, so I'm going to be uh, using my left hand to scroll around things instead of the mouse on my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how everyone is here. We've got uh, we've uh, got Ingeborg from uh, Montreal. You're the second Ingeborg that I actually know. Vanessa, mm -hmm. all right. Pam Townsend, okay. Lilacs are consumable. Yes, they are. All right. Yeah. You know yeah. who I actually learned that from first? Who? Yes. Guess who I learned that from? That Lila, uh, Kimberly? Nope, younger. <laughs> Haley. I learned that from Haley. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter. It was many years ago. <laughs> she was just a little kid and she was brought home lilac honey. And I was like, oh, I had no idea that you could do things with lilac. She was the one that taught me. Wow. I was amazed. Yeah. Yeah. She had a school project on edible flowers. I remember. Yeah. That was probably around yeah, she, that time. yeah. She did that. Yeah. Hmm. Wow, lots of folks got Philip from New Zealand and uh, Leaf uh, from San Pedro, uh, Linda from Walla Walla, way out. Walla Walla, in Eastern State. Washington, represent. Yes, Waya Waya. Hey, Bonnie. Uh, <laughs> Shanta from Atlanta. And well, I have to right. say, I'm really grateful that everyone's here because I actually showed up to this event at 1 p.m. and <laughs> no one was here and it was not very fun. John wasn't even here. I was just no. here by myself. <laughs> she said, I'm here. I'm like, what are you here for? <laughs> <laughs> so way more fun. It was not really fun without you all. So thank you so much for being here. And, it's good to and, see you. There's uh, people actually here. All over. <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh, broadcasting here over Facebook and YouTube Live. And um, so if you're watching on Facebook, and if you have a question, please do not put it in the um, like messenger chat thing. Use the whatever feed is the comment feed below the video that we're watching. So that way your questions actually show up on the thread and we can get to answering it. Um, I think that's most of the housekeeping that I can think of at the moment. I'm sure Karen will let me know more. We've got Karen and Lee helping us out here behind the scenes. So hello, Karen and Lee. And hello, you, everybody. Karen. So, um, you know, Rosalie, this is, uh, so what do we want to do first? Well, we're, we're going to plan I this right now. We could start by talking about cars because that just seems like an obvious place to start. Cars? Cars, yeah, All right. like vroom vroom. Okay, sure. Yeah. Go right yeah. So the other day, a friend, well, the other day I'm walking down the street and I see someone like from a car and they're like waving at me, you know, and I couldn't see who it was. So I just wave back. Guy. And later on, my friend said, I saw you, you know, in town and you didn't seem to think, know who I was or I guess I was kind of hesitant in my wave or something. And I said, yeah, I, I couldn't see you through the glare and the glass or whatever. And and she's like, yeah, well, didn't you recognize my car? And I was like, no, actually, that's just something about me. I have, I do not know how to recognize cars. Like, sure, if somebody has like a bright yellow Mustang, I'm going to remember that. But most cars are just, you know, like there's white cars and black cars and big cars and small cars. And 
Um, there's older cars, there's newer cars, but really like the finesse of knowing a car, like how some people get really into car models, especially classic muscle cars or whatever. And they can right. tell you if it's a 1962 or a 1963. And I just don't even recognize cars at all. And I rarely know what my friends drive. And so I was thinking about that because it's just kind of like a, a quirk of mine that I don't see cars in their individual light, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> and so sometimes it's, you know, it's come up like, oh, what were they driving? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, like a white car. <laughs> and so I might like guess, you know, like maybe it was like a Ford. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so I just, you know, I guess, I guess at what car it is. And so I was thinking about the other day of just like how identification and how our, you know, how we are able to see patterns and how I've never trained myself to see car patterns. And, you know, that's fine. That doesn't really play a big part in my life. But I was thinking about this the other day because I'm going to be very frank and partly stern in this little show oh, and tell that uh -oh. I have to do, um, is that sometimes I see people in Facebook groups, especially um, post a photo of a plant and they'll say, you know, is this plant mullen? And it'll have yellow flowers on it like a mullen plant would but it's nothing like mullen, you know, like the leaves aren't right. The flower isn't right. It, it's, it, you know, has a yellow flower, but is nothing like mullen. Or I think of recently in the wild remedies Facebook group, we've had to delete several posts um, prior to them going live because people misidentified dandelion. There were several where people misidentified dandelion and they said, Ooh, look at this cool dandelion plant I found, but it really wasn't dandelion. And so mm -hmm. when this happens, what's going on is people are plant guessing, kind of like how I would be like, ah, I think it's a white Ford car, right? right? They're, just, they're just guessing like, oh, is, I think Mullen has yellow flowers. Is this Mullen? <laughs> and if somebody's just plant curious, you know, like they're just stumbling along and they see a plant and they're like, oh, I wonder what that is. Then, you know, guessing is fine and posting in a group and asking, you know, the group, what, what is this plant? Totally fine. But if you are a forager, if you want to rely on the plants around you as food and medicine, if you're going to be picking them, you know, talking about them, you got to move beyond plant guessing. It mm -hmm. becomes a dangerous game. You know, it's, it's quirky to not know what a car is. But if you're a forager, it can be life or death to not know what a plant is. Right. And so how do we go from plant guessing to plant identification? Well, it, we have steps to do that. And it's basically super simple. It's not hard, but it just takes a little bit of time and focus. So basically what you want to do is learn botanical terms, learn the different kinds of leaves out there, um, learn how the different names for those, how they like to grow, how they're shaped, learn about the different flower parts and then how flowers are shaped and how they grow, mm -hmm. learn about habitats. And I do, um, in our book, Wild Remedies, Emily and I do this step by step for you and show you that have, we have illustrations in there and in the wild crafters toolkit, we do this really visually. And that's a course that can be found on herb mentor. And we have basically taken the information from the book and made it even more visual and have, you know, broken it down so you can see those steps and. I'm sure if I wanted to learn about cars, it would not be that hard, right? I just have to apply mm -hmm. myself a little bit and see, you know, juxtapose different cars. The same is true for plants. It's just a matter of getting your brain attuned to seeing different patterns, learning what those patterns are. And once you do that, understand the plant parts, understand how plants grow. It's a really fun experience mm -hmm. because all of these green things or the wall of green that you previously saw, individuals become more evident. And you get to see those for what they are, as opposed to, you know, just one, you know, plant guessing, essentially. And right. I have a couple, I have wrote some notes about this, so um, make sure I get everything. Oh, so one thing that I wanted to mention with that, too, is if you're brand new to plant identification, it's really fun to start with one plant. Mm -hmm. And it's a safe way to start, and it's a way to really get to know a plant. So starting with one plant, really taking your time to get to know it. Um you know, in Wild Remedies, our book, which I don't have to hold up or anything, but um, we recommend in there, we have lots of botanical terms. We have beautiful plant illustrations, but we also always recommend that you consult more than just one book. 
So you might consult other books. Here's some books that I use for my region. Uh, you can talk to other people, go to native plant societies, ask local experts, you know, whatever you can do, but don't just rely on one because even field guides are notorious for having some things wrong in them. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, another yeah. really important thing to do with plant identification is to know plant lookalikes, and then you can begin to distinguish them. So I mentioned with dandelion, dandelion is such a simple plant. It's one you know, we all think we know anyway, but there are some lookalikes that look very similar. And so if you're able to know, okay, this plant has several lookalikes, for example, there's hawkweed, mm -hmm. And hawkweed looks, the flowers look very similar to dandelion, but they have very different botanical features. With hawkweed, there's several uh, inflorescence or flowers on one stalk, whereas dandelion just has one stalk, one flower. Or the People leaf. think that uh, dandelion like flowers all summer. I'm like, no, that's not dandelion that yeah, you're seeing. Yeah, that's not dandelion. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, know the lookalikes and know how um, to tell them apart. And once you know that you have a correct ID on something, one thing that I like to do is kind of like go backwards. So like, let's say you're hanging with dandelion, you know, it's dandelion for sure. Look up in your field guide, look at wild remedies book, look at resources on herb mentor and look at how the, the plant is botanically described and look at the plant in front of you, you know, at like the same time. And that can really be helpful. I've done that with so many plants because sometimes admittedly botanical terms can be you know, it's a lot of new terms to learn. And sometimes if they're just kind of, you know, abstract in your mind, it can be harder to get. But if you're sitting with a dandelion and you're learning about it and you see, oh, okay, the leaves grow in a basil rosette and you see what that looks like in dandelion. Okay. The, um, you know, the leaves are simple and lobed, you know, then you can look at it. So that's another way is kind of work backwards and get more and more comfortable. And once you spend time with the plants, it becomes so easy. I mean, it's like getting to know people. The more time you spend with a person, the better you get to know them. Same with plants. So um, that's kind of my, my little lecture on moving from plant guessing to plant ID. And, and I think sometimes it can seem like magic. Like in the Wild Remedies Facebook group, we have Seagay, who is he is so amazing at <laughs> identifying plants via photos and people, you know, pop in their photos and he just like writes the photo on there. And he's actually in the UK and he'll, you know, name native plants here in North America really easily. And so it kind of seems like magic, but really how that happens is by learning botanical terms, by learning botanical shapes, spending time with those. So in order to get from like plant guessing to plant ID, what's in between there is learning botanical identification. And again, Wild Remedies book and especially the Wild Crafters Toolkit on Herb Mentor great ways to walk you through that. Also on Herb Mentor, we have the Learning Your Plants course, which John and I did uh, years ago. And that's based on kind of our own learnings and Thomas L. Pell's Botany in a Day book, which is also a really great resource. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Was, um, and I want to say too, there's some uh, comments that I've been just kind of watching questions yeah. and comments come in and and um, about, again, like people always say like, oh, I'll use my plant app. I have this plant ID app. And mm -hmm. I just would like to make a, I don't care how advanced plant apps get in the future, but um, what you need to do is program your brain as your plant app. Mm -hmm. Never ever, you never want to rely on an app or a computer to identify your plants. Never. You. This is a skill you want to have. We humans, our brains are designed to look at patterns and make sense of patterns. It's really yeah. easy to do. You just have to you you just have to upload that program into your brain, uh, like on the Matrix. <laughs> Talking to <laughs> <of> computers, <laughs> it wouldn't be great if you just upload the plant ID. Like, oh look, I can identify all the plants around me. Uh, but it's kind of like that in a way. And and what's nice about some of the books, um, I I used. Uh, um, I, I wish they had made a West Coast one, but their Newcomb's Wildflower Guide was a great one for the field because it had this keying system where you could go this many petals, this shape leaf, this branching pattern, and it would make a code for you like 231 or 562. And you go to the 562 page and I'll give you all what may be the possibilities. And that's how the method I used to kind of train my brain. It was cool because um, then I could, it was just a method to help me see the patterns. Now I can look at the plant and if I don't have a guide on me or anything, I could, you know, take 
okay, then I might take the phone out because I don't have a notepad with me. And I might just go, all right, like take a picture of it and go like, all right, and, and, and investigate it like why you're there because your picture might not capture everything you might be like okay this is alternate branching this has uh toothed leaves um this has a floret of uh rayed flowers this is yellow um this is hairy it's hairy like look at the details down to like what does it feel like everything you can possibly get from it and then um because what that's going to do over time is just get your brain used to seeing those patterns like in anything you've ever learned in life. And then um, all the other field guides and all the other things start to open themselves to you, you know, like you start to see. Um, but yeah, people, uh, a lot of people are asking them like uh, what ID guide or what plant guide. Rosalie, do you have, um, do, you, do you ever make a list of those? Um, I think you do have a plant ID resource list. Yeah, that's actually an amazing resource that's on Herb Mentor. I didn't do it actually. Um, my friend Val Paul did it. Um, she's really great in the botanical ID um, in her own right. And she created a list for the entire world. So it's a global resource list and um, has the top quality uh, field guides, botanical field guides for all over the world. And, you know, in places where there's, you know, for like North America, for example, there are so many different regions. Like I have this book, this is actually one of a couple books that's like specifically for my tiny region. You know, mm -hmm. obviously this book is not going to work for like Floridians. Um, so there's all sorts of regional field guides all over. Yeah. Um, this one is another wonderful one for the interior um, British Columbia in the Northwest. It's um, the companion to this. There's a couple companions. Actually, there's one for the other side of the mountains where John lives. Um, and then there's one for alpine plants. And this is like, this is a cool book um, because, because it has not only have every ID, but it has a lot of cool information in it too. So. Yeah. Because something like Wild Remedies is like that book like that. I mean, you can't have like the one perfect plant guide though that you can own that's going to have everything. Wild Remedies is great for getting you started, having you look at things, think about the greater picture, giving mm -hmm. you some recipes for some very common plants. But if you're out looking like, is this dandelion? Oh, this is not dandelion. It's something else. So that's something else isn't in Wild Remedy. So that's where the why the the field guide is, guide, is yeah. re really great for you to have for for your area. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and I Rosalie. definitely I would be very hesitant for the apps. I've tried some apps, and you know sometimes they work, and sometimes they really don't. Do you, so. do you know what I use them for? Because I would never. I, I've tried them on some wild plants, and maybe like two out of ten sort of worked right. But, uh, you know, it's like I never really learned to identify all the landscaping plants. Like there's like weird uh, head, there's know. weird perennials and bushes mm -hmm. in my yard that the previous owners planted. I'm like, what's this? And I, I try it. And a lot of those are in those databases. Right. And I've been able to, the, but that's for fun. I'm not trying to eat those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, yeah, Angela says uh, is a beginner identification is her biggest concern. Someone uh, is that one is the interior. Books. But really, the best resource is in Herb Mentor, that global resource guide we have. There's so much in there, and you'll find. And really, just Val has an attention to detail, and she chose the best books. It's not like all the books, it's the ones that you want for your region. Right. Exactly. I have some show and tell. John always gets to do show and tell. So I thought I would right. do show and tell today. Well, you're always invited to do show and tell. I don't oh. have any today. So I'm going <laughs> to leave that to you. Yeah, so I brought some plants to kind of bring this home, the whole plant guessing thing. <laughs> First one I have is this plant. This is salsify, oh, salsify. And this is an interesting plant. It's one of my husband's favorite plants. And it is a wild edible. You can eat the flowers, but mostly the roots are eaten. And um, this plant is kind of curious. It actually flowers like before 10 a.m. And my husband tells the story that when we first moved over to the side of the mountains, he would see this plant everywhere and it was like never in flower. And he did not understand why it wasn't in flower. Um, and that's because my husband sleeps in. So, <laughs> he never <saw> it. <laughs> so I guess he got up early one day and he found it in flower. But I actually had, I gave John some photos so we can show you what it looks like in flower. It's yeah, time. I know some flowers. folks that sometimes our pictures can be blurry. Rosalie does live way out there. So her, luckily we can see in here. <laughs> <laughs> Not always as clear as it uh, could be. 
Let's see. I'm going to yeah. add. Should I put those pictures up, Rosalie? Yeah. You go ahead and put those pictures up. All right. Yeah. So this plant, again, as I mentioned, it's a edible flower and, or edible root, especially. And a different version of this, I forget the species on that one. This one is dubious, but the purple flowered version of this is actually grown as a vegetable in France. Um, and that one has uh -huh. a little bit less bitter root, but it is the root. Oh, I'm showing this, which you can't really see, but there's this long tap root kind of thing. And um, if you go to, the, I think the next photo, if it's in line, so it has this huge flower head that, you know, it's in the aster family. So it looks like a dandelion flower head. And I'll have people ask me like probably once a year, you know, a local friend will ask me, there's some huge dandelion seed heads out there right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about salsify. And yeah, so that's salsify and it's prevalent right now. It's everywhere. And it's just really, really common plant. And I wanted to show you salsify because I wanted to juxtapose that with another plant. Maybe you can come back to me, John. Okay. Um, coming back to you there. Let's see. Um, I'm getting there. Let's see. And then I'm going to take myself off there. There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. This plant is called death camas, which is a great name for it because this is one of our most poisonous plants in North America. It's very common, especially where I live. The name of it is Zigadenus venenosus, which is like, sounds like a villain. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's called, so it's called death camas for good reason. And this plant has a bulb. You see that? Let me go back to my screen here. I was looking at my notes. Um, so it has a bulb on there. And you see it has these grass-like leaves. And you see this has these grass-like leaves. Obviously, the flowers of these are very different, right? You wouldn't, if you remember what the salsa fee flower looks like, kind of dandelion-esque, aster family-esque. Mm -hmm. And then this one, um, they don't look anything alike. But when they're younger, these plants look very similar. And death camas will easily kill you. So obviously, the roots are very different. So one is a bulb and one is a um, long tap root. So if you dug them up, you would know like, oh yeah, that's definitely um, not the right one or is the right one based on that. There's also other identifying features, which I don't know if you'll be able to see really well in here, but um, let me see if I can get this. On salsify, there's these little hairs, like how John was earlier saying um, that, you know, you need to look at all the details. You can see here this white stuff. There's little hairs on there. And so it's a hairy root. It also has a pink tinge to it that you don't see with death camas. The other plant that looks a lot like death camas when young is wild onions. And wild onions look very mm. similar to this. They both grow in this habitat as well. And so that's a really good reason. You know, when these are young, you want to be able to tell those plants apart really well. With the wild onions, they have the same bulb-like look to them. So that can be another, you know, very scary plant to misidentify. So I say this not to like scare anyone, you know. You don't? Be no, scare me. Everyone should be scared. No, they're coming out of I really want to be out of like, This is important, you know. Like we need to say <laughs> no to plant guessing and learn botanical ID. Once you know the difference between these plants, you know it. And you're not going to confuse them. But if you're just seeing the wall of green and you're just guessing about things, then they're easily confused. And in Wild Remedies and in the Wild Crafters Toolkit course on Herb Mentor, one of our biggest suggestions is that you start, the first plants you learn are the poisonous ones, the ones that grow near you. So you look at your regional field guide, you find out which plants are poisonous, and you learn those ones really well. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Trip. I do like the Zigadenus, though. Yeah, Zigadenus um, is what I right. I keep ignore forgetting that. that. Forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Trip. <laughs> and hi, Trip. Hi, hey, Trip. You're ruining it for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so... That's my my little stern lecture on learning how to identify those things really well. And let's show some pictures of death camas. I mm -hmm. gave those to you. Okay. And then I I have another death camas story that I think. You gotta is, get back uh, on that screen there. That's where yeah, we so were. Yes, that's at the salsify with that seed head. There we go. I just took this photo like moments. Well, I took it just before one when I thought we were meeting, <laughs> but I just took this photo ah. today. Um, and this is just out in my front yard. This is death camas. Yeah, let's see what other ones I put in here. Um, yeah, I think there's 
So this one's not a very good photo. I was just out there with my phone camera, but this, and if you can see, there's like seven growing right there. And I was just one tiny patch. I mean, they're like all over my front yard. So in full bloom right now, which is why they're on my mind. Next photo. Wow. So this is a, kind of a good beautiful photo. Of, what was that? It's a beautiful plant. It is a really beautiful plant. And and uh and and I think the difference is between this now. Were you going to talk about? I don't want to ruin it for you, but were you going to talk about like actual camas camas that people? Well, I, it just occurred to me that I should t talk about that. Yeah, the reason why it didn't around, occur to me is because we don't have camas growing here. But there is a very fascinating. important camas plant that grows a lot in Washington. Very important edible for many of the first peoples here. And it has a purple flower and looks mm -hmm. very similar. It's actually a different genus. Um, I, the, that camas is, it is. Um, But this, so they look very similar. And um, I learned about death camas when I was harvesting edible camas. And my teacher taught me, you never harvest edible camas unless it's in full flower. And you always keep the flower head attached to the bulb. Because these two will grow side by side. And they have a very similar looking bulb. So it's the real deal. Um, yeah. And so this photo right here is actually in my chicken coop. And the chickens, those are smart ladies. You see that? They have like decimated all of the plants around it, but they knew not to touch uh, death camas. So smart ladies. Next photo. Oh, There's there. the ladies. There's Aren't the they so cute? Yeah, that's Stellaria Aww. two and three. Um, Stellaria two and Stellaria three. <laughs> You named them all yeah, Stellaria. Stellaria one got eaten by a gross hawk, so that was, or goss hawk, so oh. that was, yeah, not so great. Um, but it was the perfect botanical name for them because it you know looks like stars and everything. So uh -huh. two and three <laughs> can't tell them apart. Um, Oops. Yeah, we just. Are you so, sure that? <laughs> not right. yet. I was gonna, you know, that was the big surprise. Okay, um, I'll lead up to it. All right. <laughs> well, that was the sneak peek. <laughs> so years ago, I was at a wedding. It was a friend's wedding. And I was actually the photographer for the wedding, very casual wedding. Um, and as I was taking photos of the bride and groom, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and she said, I think you should come take a look at this cake, the wedding cake. And I was kind of honestly a bit annoyed because I was like, don't you see I'm taking photos here? <laughs> and she was like, he goes, yeah, I think you really need to come take a look at this. Cake. I'm a photographer, damn it. Not an herbal. Because there's a really interesting lily on it, she tells me. And immediately I was like, huh? And so um, stopped the photo lesson or pho photography, went over, checked out the cake, and go ahead and show that photo. This was the cake. And it's um, beautifully decorated. That's our native yellow sunflower that blooms all over the hillsides in springtime. And draped over that is death camas. And somebody um, out of the area decorated this cake so beautifully. She's actually a good friend of mine. Um, and she's uh, learning to be an herbalist. Uh, but this is before she knew this plant. And, you know, she just saw it growing in uh, the meadow and thought, wow, that would be really pretty on the cake. So that's a really good cautionary tale right there and how important it is. Like, again, if you're a plant curious person and you're not picking or touching or smelling or eating any of the plants you see, you can be a plant guesser. But if you're in any way participating in plants, you've got to know botanical ID and you've got to be certain what's out there. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't, what, what we ended up doing with this cake is we scraped off all of the icing and they miraculously had just made a ton of icing or frosting. So Scraped off all of that, threw it away, and re-iced it up, and it was okay in the end. Um, but that was definitely a very cautionary tale there. I just put this up real quick because I googled that real quick, and that was a common camas, so you could just see the um, see the difference in the flowers. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they look very different when in bloom, but when they're not in bloom, they look very different. Very different. Yeah, that's why, um, like the. the Native, uh, the first peoples here, they they uh, planted camas fields, and 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 there's relics of them in different places, big camas fields, and that was an important food crop. And um, one of the even if they're planting camas, I, I I believe 
that they, you know, then they would know that they could harvest it and more likely not be death camas. But I think it was one of those situations where, you know, if you're going to harvest one, this is one you harvest when it's flowering mm -hmm. because you know for sure that it's the right camas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one of those examples of uh, breaking the breaking the basic rules of mm -hmm. uh, something. Um, all right. So I that was cool. So do you want to get some uh, some questions or do you have more? Yeah, to... seeing some that are just like really relevant to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Someone's wondering sure. if they say, um, Pam says, some plants indicate soil deficiencies. Does death camas? Death camas is a native wildflower and it's very common. So I don't believe that it is. It just, it grows here natively. Um, and somebody mentioned that wild onions smell like onions and it's true. They do. And wild camas are the top death camas does not. So that's a great indication again mm -hmm. of like knowing the plants really well. You wouldn't want to rely on that solely as your identification, the smell of them, right? Because there's other ways to tell them apart. But um, but whether whatever plant we're talking about, you know, you want to have multiple ways to be able to tell those apart. And the other thing is that when I see lilies like this or I see grasses like this, I just have it's programmed into me to be mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, pay extra special attention. When I mm. see leaves of three on a vine going up a tree, I think pay special attention, you know, could be poison ivy, poison oak. Could be. Um, if I see the umble family, uh, umble effery family and white flowers, I think, okay, pay special attention, could be water or hemlock or poison hemlock. So I like this comment that Katrina made where she said my mom would tell his kid to look for the flowers to tell the difference between death camas and wild onion. The onion, of course, smell like onion. They also have pretty little purple flowers that look a bit more like mini garlic flowers. So yeah, they do. They have really cool. pretty flowers. My mom yeah. didn't know that much as much as uh, about plants as Katrina's plant mom. <laughs> and, uh, my, my mom told me, uh, John, just look out for, you know, don't touch anything that has three leaves. Cause she, you know, cause I had this bad case of poison ivy when I was in Cub Scouts. I mean, really bad. I was out of school for like a month. I mean, my face was oh, like, out of oh. it was one of the most horrible cases. So she made me afraid of anything with three leaves, which is a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what i later discovered when i started identifying plants well there's a lot of plants with three even though technically it's three leaflets but yeah. right and sometimes <laughs> it's different and yeah yeah it's definitely. Uh, um, but you know when you see those kinds of things you definitely want to pay attention um somebody said are there any visible common traits that poisonous plants often display plant parts like bulbs etc no they come in all shapes and sizes that's why getting a regional field guide and seeing what plants grow near you is really important um mm. so i would highly recommend that and let's see there was another one somebody said is a botanical loop useful yes mm. and so that's uh, you know, like a little, basically a magnifying glass that hold up to your eye and you can take a look at little, you know, closer up plant parts. And I always keep one in my hiking bag. So I always have it with me. Um, that's really fun to look at the, you know, really close up details, especially mm. like flower parts of a plant. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I think that was my, my uh, cautionary tale, my show and tale about um, poisonous plants. Oh, and I had one more thing to share about that um, subject is that just last year, a beloved teacher and somebody who has decades of experience in botanical ID and as a teacher was actually with her students walking down a trail and she saw what she thought was Queen Anne's lace and she popped some in her mouth and she landed in the hospital because it actually ended up being one of the hemlocks. Wow. And she, you know, that was, she wrote about it and said it was a big lesson in humility for her and, um, and a good lesson for all of us. You know, she's a beloved teacher, lots of experience. And you just take two seconds of being not mindful or cocky or whatever. And, um, you know, and just go for something and that it could be serious trouble. So I, there's no, there's also, you know, no shame in not knowing everything and no shame in looking something up and being extra special cautious, you know, absolutely. So that was my last cautionary tale. On and there's really no need to be just casual about anything in the carrot family. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's really, I just don't, I just like, even if I'm like, oh, that's Queen Anne's leg. I, I don't, I don't eat it. I'm just like, I don't know. I don't really need this Queen Anne's lace. So it's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think if I remember correctly, she said that, you know, she'd been on that trail many times. She'd never seen mm. a hemlock growing and she'd seen Queen, Zan, Queen Anne's lace growing there, you know, 
And so it was just kind of all of that led up to this moment of her just being like, Nope. And, yeah. um, and just that one bite, I mean, she ended up in the emergency room with that one bite. So. Did, did she say anything about like anything about the experience? Like when she ate it, what sensations did he, she have in her mouth or what, what kind of feelings I came know, over I her? I did talk about that, but I can't remember, but she oh, said okay. it was kind of like pretty quickly afterward, like pretty quickly after she chewed it up, she knew something was wrong. I, you know, the oils from a plant can be more like in a so hot, sunny day can be more pronounced. And I remember one time years ago, I was to, I touched some water hemlock. I was in Minnesota um, and a uh, hot day. And um, I just had a little bit in my hands because I was actually just go, oh, this water hemlock and showing somebody and touching it, you know, thinking like that wouldn't do anything. And I, and I don't, of course, remember as a long time ago if I touched my fit or anything or but I just remember I felt like like sort of nauseous. Mm -hmm. yeah a little nauseous yeah. so yeah, um, you don't need to play around with for sure. yeah 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 we have tons of another it. another one ones we could talk about is the difference between comfrey and foxglove those two look very similar before flowering when they're just leaves i mean they, they look very similar so there's lots of things out there and again that's why you know about lookalikes because if like if you have a good book mm -hmm. and you're looking at comfrey it'll say in there this will look a lot like foxglove which is potentially toxic and, and yet, um, when you do that and you work with comfrey or you're growing it or you're using it or you're harvesting it for medicine and you and you use it year after year and you establish that relationship, um, like at this point, I don't think I can mistake in foxglove for comfrey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like that's not going to happen because I know what comfrey, you know, like because I yeah. will. And that's yeah, the advantage easy. of this it's time. very easy. Yeah. Yeah. But right. Earlier on, there's to see those big leaves coming out and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So uh, we can talk about all kind, any topics or things that people want to talk. We just started with this plant ID thing because uh, Rosalie is excited about her death cam is cake. <laughs> <laughs> and she had show and tell. Yeah. Um, I actually thought about like the death canvas was blooming. And so I thought, well, that'd be a fun thing to show people and just talk about, you know, potential seriousness. And I'd, I'd forgotten about the cake story until just uh, like late this morning. And then I wrote John, I was like, can you put a photo up? today <laughs> yes so. we, modern technology <laughs> we can very put photos amenable up. to that oh so that's cool so uh, sue had asked to talk about hemlock and we did so um just um yeah just about plan id and uh getting to know the families and it's just so much like people like getting to know people and getting to know their families what are their patterns you know to the point now where like i can go to a place um that i don't know the exact species and look at a plant and know that oh this is in the mint family and i can't think of any poisonous mint family member so if i'm sure it's in the mint family i got that square stem and the opposite leaves um there's a really good chance that plant's really not going to be poisonous so there's things like that. The more you work with them and, and you can work with families. I don't want to, uh, that's a disclaimer. I don't know. I don't know. There's always, there's, only, there's always one plant that breaks the rules. <laughs> it's like opposite leaves, square stem. Well, what about nettle? Well, yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> it's got opposite leaves anyway. <laughs> a little bit of a square stem. Um, yeah, somebody's um, asking about burdock and if there's, um, you know, poisonous lookalikes for burdock. And so one thing about that that I think is another good thing to mention is that, so I mentioned that foxglove and comfrey can look very similar. And John's saying like, oh, you know, I wouldn't confuse them now because I know them so well. But in the beginning, it's, you can confuse anything. Yeah. So what I think look like looks like burdock might be nothing about, you know, like someone else may more easily confu confuse burdock because maybe in their mind, they just see big leaves and, you know, they don't know about looking at the underside of it to see the silvery gray color under there. They don't know the feel of that compared to another leaf like mullen. Um, in fact, I've actually seen yeah. that in the Wild Remedies Facebook group, someone posting, I can't remember now, one or the other mullen flowers or burdock or mullen leaves or burdock leaves, but it was the other things. So um, I would never think to confuse those two, but it's very easy to do that again if you're, you know, just your eye hasn't been trained yet. Um, some Bye. plants might be confused. There's rhubarb and that could be confusing with, um, burdock. And those are definitely, you don't want to eat rhubarb leaves. Um, there's cocklebur and that could be mistaken for burdock. Um, so there are some out there and again, you know, it's a good idea to really get to know burdock, um, spend time with it 
and really see it. And really, it doesn't take, like, you don't have to become a PhD in botanical ID. It just takes some spending time with the plants um, and, to, to get it. And also, like, where it, where it's growing, like, um, what how burdock looks in my yard, it's going to be, they may look a little different as far as size and, sh and slight shape and things in Rosalie's yard, or that's an example. But um and sometimes different eco like you could be traveling somewhere maybe like oh this is already seeded where i live but it may be just coming up there or higher up in elevation mm -hmm. or it can look things can look just a little different sometimes too so as you get to know them and that's why it's good to know those core identification patterns because then like when you get down to that then you know uh more likely that that's that but um you know it's it's can be really interesting how the same species can look different and uh not fast but but sometimes they do i mean like say poison ivy that's a trickster because yeah. like you know it could be a bush it can be a running vine it could be a thick hairy vine up a tree you go to eastern wash I mean, and then and then and then as soon as you think that it doesn't grow anywhere near where i live in the in the pacific northwest like you in the in the um in the west side of the cascades you go to like a park in seattle where it's this one spot where it's like everywhere it's one park it's like, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, so there's always, you know, that's so it's good. This stuff keeps you on your feet, keeps you aware, keeps you paying attention, keeps you present in nature. And that's what it's about, right? Your connection and should be fun, not like overwhelming. To me, it's a challenge and it's fun. Like, and I don't like, like, you know, I can, I know that it feels overwhelming to begin with, but as soon as you meet one, one, one front friend and then another, and then before you know it, you start going, oh, okay, I got this. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sandy says, I find that even when I look up the plants in an ID book, I still have a hard time trusting that I found the right plant. Any suggestions? I totally hear you on that one because it can be difficult to take, you know, something in a flat piece of paper and translate it into um, what you're seeing in front of you. So I do have a couple of suggestions on that one. Um, if you can find somebody near you know that's in your region to learn with that's an excellent way that's how i learned plants and i definitely can appreciate that, that i really am so grateful i had a mentor that was there with me teaching me about it so some places you can go are interpretive centers uh, native plant societies have chapters all over north america and they often offer free field trips they have free meetings and those mm -hmm. people love to geek out about plants and so to have another you know new plant person walk up and um, ask about them usually makes their day. So there's that, you know, there's herbalists leading plant walks, there's um, nature centers, botanical gardens. So look for the plant people near you and you'll the find them. They're, they're there. And the um, plant people. Yeah, you'll find them. So <laughs> they're near point. you. Another way is um, <laughs> if you're a member of Herb Mentor, we have so many videos and that can be helpful just instead of just yeah. seeing like a photo or just, you know, the botanical ID description but seeing a video of it and that can be really helpful too. Um, I, I don't know what the status of herbal conferences are at this point in this summer with so many things being canceled, but um, you know, there've been so many regional herb conferences happening that people have been doing. There's Southeast, Northeast, mm -hmm. Midwest, there's, Excellent. they're all over. About plants. And that's where you meet people and meet the herbal teachers near you. Cause a lot of herbalists, local herbalists, and though it's great about the local conferences is it it brings a lot of more local herbalists and you'll find out like oh i didn't know this person taught near me and for me the first teacher that i had that taught me um was a woman named Erin, and she still teaches uh up that way i can i can look across the, the ocean right up well the, the bay right there that way um and um and i was at a nerve conference and i she did a, a walk and then a class and i uh, found out it was like an hour hour and a half drive at the time but uh, I carpooled with somebody near me and we took our first uh, herbal classes together at her place. So like, yeah, yeah, that's a great place, but I don't know like how things are. It's yeah. With, 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 with what's been happening and cancellations. I don't know. So I've got to yeah. check that out. And yeah. yeah. So, um, oops. What was that? Oh, so other, um, yeah. And then, you know, looking for just multiple sources of information because sometimes things can click. And then again, um, with that, if 
that backwards looking up of things. So like once you know a plant, it can be any plant, and you know that that is the correct one, use your field guide and read the botanical terms that's used to describe that plant and look at it and figure that out. Um, and maybe this is maybe just something that works for me. I don't know. But sometimes those botanical terms are kind of odd. And so it helps to be like, oh, okay, it's describing it like this. And that's, you know, now I see what that means in real life. And just to get more comfortable with botanical ID terms. And again, it's, there's like that magicness of being able to say like, oh, that's a plant and I know what it is. How you get there is by learning botanical terms, by understanding the different parts of the plant and being able to describe those, you know, what is the leaf shape? What's the flower shape? So again, we do that in Wild Remedies. We take you through that step-by-step, step, which is Emily Hans in my book, just came out this spring. And then what we did is we took that information and we made it even more visually um, extrapolated. And we did that for Wild Crafters Toolkit. And actually right now, this week, in the Wild Remedies Facebook group, we are showing the plant identification video all this week. Um, so it's like a 22 minute full section, but we're breaking it into a smaller section so you can get chunks of that all this week. So you can view mm -hmm. that for free right now in the Wild Remedies Facebook group. But it really shows you like, you, those are the beginning steps of learning botanical ID. So it's mm -hmm. not just saying like, I know the, the goal is that you wanna look at a plant and know what it is right away, but how you get there is by learning these individual parts. Right. And I like this um, <clears throat> question that Kathy gave about with so many vine type plants with leaves of three, what is the best way to tell if poison ivy or something else um, that is safe? Well, I would say that until you know for sure, just assume it's poison ivy. <laughs> and then, uh, then I mean, I mean, like don't harvest it for anything until you know exactly what it is. Um, and then you have a reason to harvest it, of course. We go into that in the book in the Wild Crafters Toolkit, but um, but um, but yeah, you you'll you'll get to know it. I mean, you'll get you'll get to know because poison ivy. Once you know poison ivy, it's poison ivy. It doesn't matter what form the wood or the bushes or the shape it is. The leaves are the leaves, and so leaflets. There's actually one leaf divided into three. It's a leaflet, not three leaves. But um, but I don't know. From East Coast, I'm trying to remember. Are there really viney ones with leaves with three? I, when the viney ones, not too many. I mean. I mean, you know, there's uh, there's Virginia creeper, but that has five leaflets. That's what I'm thinking of, but mm. I don't know. Yeah. Patricia says, hi, Patricia. She says, when I was learning as a child, our elders wouldn't let us pick anything until we have watched the particular plant go through all the seasons. And I remember, when John, when you were first learning, um, it wasn't necessarily like that, but you did spend a year, like you had the, you know, you'd learn a plant for a month, learn a plant for a year. Mm -hmm. You really spent a lot of time learning individual plants and really spending a lot of time. And that's, that's how we love to learn them uh, Yeah, as herbalists. I mean, that's often the recommendation. I find it a little impractical just in the sense, like when I first started botanical ID, I wanted to know everything. And I definitely spend a lot of time with my field guides, a lot of time out in the field. I did an herbarium, which was really fun, which is basically, you know, Oh yeah. Um, I did like, hundreds and hundreds of pressed plants that I put into my herbarium. Yeah, I forgot I about that. Like all, you know, all in on that. <laughs> um, yeah. But I still, even though I was just like, I was just following my inspiration and running with it in my obsessive personality type of way, but I was still getting to know individual plants, you know, well. So um, yeah, so that's definitely something to consider there. Yeah, I, I, I would get like, um, yeah, it can be frustrating because I was like, um, I remember with elder, you know, I could identify elder, but I had the hardest time just finding the berries, the right berries that I wanted to harvest or where they were, or it wouldn't work out. And then I kind of let go. And I said, you know what, maybe elder just doesn't want to, not ready quite to work with me yet until I'm ready to approach it. Because sometimes you have this mentality like, oh, I got to go harvest and do this and make this thing that I want to do. But like, you know, it's nature. And sometimes it's, and it's about your connection. And it's like, we always use this analogies between people, uh, between people. But I think it's so true about relationships. And sometimes if you have a friend and, you know, like, uh, or a person that you might be friends with, sometimes maybe at first uh, you don't hang out. And then eventually there's some experiences which bring you together and you hang out and you become friends. There's so many ways. And I, I really, I mean, after having so many experiences, I think it's very similar. As soon as I was ready to approach Elder with a certain respect and a certain um, 
like when I was sure of my connection and what I wanted to use the elder like flowers or the berries for, it started like flowing and the experiences started flowing and finding it started flowing and my harvesting. And then, and then in time I kind of got it. And then, you know, even now, um, sometimes when I feel like, Oh, I need my elderberries for so-and-so, if it doesn't feel quite right, I just don't go do it. You know, like I just like, sometimes I've gone all the way to Eastern Washington where I harvest and have gotten there. And it's just like, no, not harvesting. It's not, not the not year for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, especially years when I've, and I've gotten to know it in that area. So, well, one year I went there, I'm like, I really wanted to make wine this year, but I went there and it was such a dry year. I, I went up to harvest some umbles and they just, everything just, it was, I was just breaking the tree up. It was so dry. And I'm like, no, any berries that are here, the birds need these, the animals need these, and I don't want to mess with these plants. And I just say, okay, it's not, don't need to make my syrup this year, or I can find another place to get the berries. So, you know, and I only would have really known that if I hadn't had that relationship and know the area over many years or know the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Know what it looks like when it's abundant and when mm -hmm. it's not. And it's not I've seen not. several requests for people wondering about regional field guides. So again, if you are a member of Herb Mentor, highly recommend, recommend our plant resource guide there because it's been specially picked for global resources. So everything from Africa to Australia which is A to A, I guess, but <laughs> there's a lot in there. Um, then other things you can do, go to your local independent bookstore, ask them what are the field guides of the area, interpretive centers, botanical centers, uh, if you have national parks nearby, um, you know, any of those, the, I know our local forest service office has local field guides for sale there. So just, you know, check out again, find the plant people and ask them because you really want a regional guide. There's, you know, there's not really, you don't want to like a plant guide to North America. <laughs> you really mm -hmm. want a regional one. So, um, I, and, I just want to point out a question and like, and this is actually a statement and this person's whole name isn't there, but I just thought that's why I'm doing this. Uh, <laughs> uh, from YouTube that tomato plants can look like poison ivy. I, I don't agree. And this is sort of like what uh, what Rosalie was saying earlier, that when we say things or assume. So I would say that like, if you think something like, do tomato plants look like poison ivy? Like, like go look them up and go find them and see if that's really true. Like, have you been growing tomatoes? Have you been looking for poison ivy? And compare them. Um, because it's, then if people are like, oh, tomato plants look like poison ivy, it's just like, mm, I don't know, do they? So just putting that out there because this makes it fun to, to learn about. So I'm not trying to point anybody out or, you know, say, no, I don't, I just, I, this was a great illustration. So thank you, A, that I just wanted to put out there. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Okay. Here's some other, thanks, Patricia. Um, any ones here yeah, you want to come in later and you're wondering about things you will be able to rewatch this so um yeah. repeat everything you can watch it over again yeah um and true mike says yeah right <laughs> at the same time mike says herbal learning is a never-ending process which makes it so interesting and that is so true yeah and, and it's so um, many different layers too you know like that's one thing um for example um I learned this from Kimberly, actually, John's wife, many years ago. She told me every year she likes to make something new with her favorite plants. And I really love that. And I also try to incorporate that in as well. So, you know, just trying like something new, something I've never tried before. Um, sneak, this will be a little sneak peek coming up really soon on the Learning Herbs newsletter. I made a cake with lemon. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> it is so amazing. The cake is good. And then I made an icing um, with the lemon balm syrup. Oh, it's so good. Um, so if you're not signed up on the Learning Herbs newsletter, I definitely sign up for that because we're going to be mailing that out, I believe, next week. I think I have a thing for that. Oh, yeah, I made this little scrolling thing. I forgot about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> you could actually yeah. go to the bottom of the learningherbs.com homepage and get on our email list and to get our those cool things so rosalie let me ask you is that cake is it for my birthday are you mailing me a copy of the cake i'm sending <laughs> you a photo and telling you that as i eat this cake i will think about you 
Oh, it's next Wednesday, my birthday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we you should know, see how how old we'll your birthday, John. Is that your birthday is always when the lady slippers bloom here? So. Oh, that's very poetic. Yeah, when I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant birthday. to say for people to guess how old I'm going to be. I don't, don't guess anything. Don't guess anything above 37. fifty. Don't give anything. Don't guess anything above fifty. <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> I'm feeling a little <laughs> sensitive on the subject. You can, guess, you can guess anything below 51, but not anything above 50. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I was supposed to be in Ireland in the in the old world. I was supposed to be uh uh hiking with my son in Ireland, but, uh, yeah. but we're going to have a great birthday. Anyway, my son's home and he's going to be stay home for my birthday. We're going to do a, on a hike and stuff. It's going to be fun. Yep. Trip. You guessed it. 50. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's see. Wow. It's already 50 minutes. We're into this already. Wow. So, uh, 49.99. Yes, Johan. That's what I am right now. <laughs> um, Thanks for all the birthday wishes. And you can send presents to P.O. Box. No, <laughs> <laughs> or cake. All right. Um, let's see. Will the book club, let's see. Well, what's this? Will the book club for herbal remedies you did for the month of May be on Herb Mentor Book Club? Oh, no. No. Do you want to answer that, Rosalie? Sure. Yeah. So this is referring to the Wild Remedies Facebook group and uh, which is based on the book and for the month of may we did a bunch of discussion prompts and um our we're in our final week and we're at the end of the week for people who participate we do a drawing for um an annual membership to our mentor but those you know basically that's kind of like come and gone because we did those discussion prompts and had the discussions yeah. what we're gonna do is um, we are going to archive that group when it's all over, which means that anybody who's a member of it now will always have access to it. So you can go through and look at those discussion prompts and, and see all mm -hmm. the fun posts of their people making all sorts of fun recipes. Um, so after the month of May, we aren't going to be doing new posts in there, and but we you'll have access to all of the old ones. So Yes, we're always on Herb Mentor. Rosalie is, goes in the forum still. You've been uh, probably for about 11 years, Rosalie, or 12 years, dozen years going in and uh, answering yeah, questions. It's 2008, right? Oh. Yeah, 2008, right. Wow. Oh, no, 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 no. It's 2007. Yeah. It was, fall, it was the fall Something of like 2007. That. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I had just moved here and I had Wi-Fi for the first time. It was like fast Wi-Fi. I'd never had that in my life. And... um. And you started Herb Mentor. And I remember I spent a lot of, I, I was obsessively stalking the forums um, and answering questions. I was like, and it was the winter, you know, it was like, cause you started it like in October or something. Yes. So it was, no. you know, winter, snow on the ground. I had a lot of free time <laughs> and I spent it in the forum. So yeah, yeah, it's been like 12 years now. <sighs> yeah. And so as active as, you know, as they more active than they've ever been and, we have lots of wonderful folks in there, like Lee, um, really supporting people and herbalists like Henriette Cress and myself jumping in there. So they're a great place to get, um, to be able to like ask somebody and get a response. Get and, a response. And you can. I had, this, I had this experience the other day that I was, um, had something wrong with my Patreon account and it took me 20 minutes to figure out how to email them the problem because none of the, like the FAQ things, you know, were helping me. And then because of COVID, there's a week long delay. Um, and I just thought, and I, in that moment, I was just like, wow, isn't it so cool? Or mentor, you just like can get on the forum and ask somebody. And I was like, right then and there, you know, there's no like spend 20 minutes figuring out how to get to a human. I yeah. probably feel of Patreon. I do love Patreon, but there's a problem with my account. <laughs> it's kind of annoying that it's taking, you know, this long to figure it out. I like I like that you can just have a thread and you have a question and you can just keep discussing that one thing under it and then go back to it and it's always there and um, and then that's where we can safely have discussions like in Facebook it's it's challenging because you don't know you don't know who's out there and who's listening watching and whatnot and in our own environment we can have longer discussions we can have more in depth discussions and also um, we have the case study 
part and the case study part, we are very responsible. If someone has like something they want to learn about chronic um, so herbs for some chronic situation. We have a long, we have a case study form program, which allows the you to go in and, and really dive into it and learn to think like an herbalist and, um, and, and, and with the help of other people. And you go through that and you can just geek out and go deep. Like you could never really go on a Facebook thread when it's buried 20,000 things deep before, you know, I know it. what happens on Facebook is somebody says, you know, like what herbs are good for high blood pressure. And in places like Alchemy of Herbs, which we have a very large bustling um, group of people there, within minutes, there'll be 20, 30, you know, 50 replies and everyone just saying like the one thing, you know, and the, the replies are just all over the place. And, um, and it's just like for the person asking it, I always wonder, you know, like, how is yeah. that, you know, for you, because you've like asked this question, now you have a hundred responses of these random people's advice. And, you know, how do you know, like what to use or how to do it? And that's what we do on the case study lab um, in the forum is we show people how to like really get that information um, in a way that's actually helpful. And, and we do plan ID. Yeah. And, 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 plan. I, yeah. and we can post yeah. pictures of plants and we can geek out on it and take our time and look at it. And so yeah. I like Mike's uh, um, uh, comment in my arrows, Commodore 64 and slide rollers. So 50 is great. Uh, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I started computers on my Atari 800 in 1981. I actually had a, a BBS. It was a, before the internet and the, it was a computer to computer. We would dial in and we would dial we would straight one computer at a time. I was doing that. I was 11, 12 years old in my basement. That's why, you know, that's kind of the root of learning herbs. <laughs> yeah. Then I went outside for a long time and I learned about plants and then I just brought it all together. <laughs> that's my life story. Yeah, yeah, which is awesome. I'm so glad <laughs> I did that. Definitely had no idea what Commodore 64 meant, but they yeah, it's way before your time. <laughs> <laughs> it's an early computer. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody for the come. Wow, it's almost at an hour. If I have any other questions before we take off, or people asking about violets, I saw some of them. You can grow violets in Southern California. Karen gave me that question there. Karen probably knows better than I. I'm going to say no, um, or at least you're going to have to be like kind of coddle them because what they like is they like cool and they like damp. And that mm. is not really how I, that's not my impression of um, Southern California. You could probably, you know, baby them in a way to get it to go, but I'm not sure that that is um, where you would really find them. Um, yeah, Karen says definitely not in an ordinary way. She's from San Diego, so <laughs> not in an ordinary way. Someone else asked if you can grow them in pots and I don't see why not. It seems like you should be able to do that. Yeah. Back in the beginning, I actually saw a question about Johnny jump ups and if you could use Johnny jump ups in the same way that you can use violets. I have never done that, but I have seen her herbalists like Carolyn Gagnon, who's a, um, French Canadian. Uh herbalist. She talks about doing that. And I just saw a post from Larkin Bunce, who teaches at the Vermont Center for Integrative Herbalism um, at, over in Vermont. And she talked about using Johnny Jump Ups as well. So my garden is actually full of Johnny Jump Ups this year. So and they're all in bloom right now. So after I saw Larkin's post about them, I thought it'd be fun to try something with them because I've never used them. I've used them as uh, beauty medicine, you know, putting them in in salads and you know using them as decorations, but I've never mm. them medicinally. So I think that would be something interesting to try. Here's a question about plantain. Is there benefits to tincturing plantain root? I'm not sure. I've never Deep. really heard of somebody using the root before. I've wondered that myself. Just it is interesting. We typically use the leaves and not the roots, but I don't know anything about using the root. Tincture of the leaves, definitely. I really like a tincture of the leaves. Um, wonderful for modulating inflammation. I often put it in um, seasonal allergy blends. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Trip. He said, uh, thanks for the kitchen visit last week. Yeah, we did last week. We did a, um, a live from my kitchen with my whole family, and we were uh, doing a lot about Herb Fairies, our children's program, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So a lot of exper a lot of technical good. experimenting. That was fun. <laughs> so we got, yeah, 
Um, yes, pansies, the viola tricolor and garden pansies, you can eat all of those. And um, they're really fun as edible flowers. Actually, one of, I think the most, one of the most shared photos from Wild Remedies was a spring rolls that Emily did with these beautiful pansies in them. Um, but yeah, you can use them in all sorts of beautiful ways. Hmm. Here's a good um, tour. Oh, this is a good question. I would say yes on the raised beds. Yeah, raised beds or amending the soil in some way. Um, I actually, my first small garden was mostly clay soils and I amended it very strongly with um, lots and lots of compost. And um, I amended it with soil amendments like compost. And then I grew red clover as a cover crop uh, for two seasons and mulched that in. Uh, so it's bringing that like kind of green uh, manure, those green nutrients in. And then I had a thriving garden after that. So you, you can definitely start with, with mm -hmm. clay and, um, and improve upon it. Somebody was asking for a garden tour. I don't know who she was talking about, but um, I've thought about doing a garden tour because my garden is looking pretty cool. Yeah. And I have, like Wi-Fi, so it couldn't be like live, you know, because I'm out in the boonies. So there's no, there's no cell reception. But Kimberly could also do a, a garden tour. That would be really fun. Yes. Yeah, let's figure that one out. <laughs> I can do it with my phone out. What was that, John? Uh, I missed that. I said, oh, sorry. My uh, phone, um, I could probably do it from my phone, do a live from my phone or something. Yeah. Or, or yeah, record it. We could record it and just upload it and play it on something like this. Let me show you this. Uh, so uh, Haley had to do this assignment where um, she was making um, tacos for uh, a class. Like they had to find creative ways to finish school up. So she had to do something creative with her tacos. So she, um, let me see, she did a, uh, yeah, here we go. She did a, she did a wild, a wild flowers taco or she, uh, this is just the other day. We have borage, we have miner's lettuce in there. The, what's left of it uh, this time of year. Uh, calendula flowers, some rose and borage I see on, on top of all of the usual taco fixings. But uh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to show that since we were talking somebody cool, asking about viola flowers and stuff. That's fun. Um, yeah, we cool. do have, I did do a garden tour um, of my old garden. Remember, John, you came and filmed that? Yeah, is it an herb mentor? It's, it's in Taste it's of Herbs for sure. I realized that the other day. It's um, it's in herb mentor and it's also in Taste of Herbs. So if you're a okay. Taste of Herbs member, mem member, it's in the bonus section. And if you're an herb mentor, it's in there. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, but it's your old, it's an old garden though. It's not the current garden. Yeah, it's not the current garden. Yeah, it's an old house that you're in. So, yeah. but the new one is a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, someone asked what herbs I grow in my garden. It was part of an interview, and I was like, uh, I grow oh, over a wow. hundred medicinal plants. Yeah. <laughs> so, I didn't know and what some that I don't even probably realize I am growing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, many of them do grow as weeds. <laughs> They're all there. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of plant walks on Herb Mentor. Um, you can go yeah. to plant walks and you click on which herbal list you want to watch. And yeah, Rosemary really Gladstar, Seven Song, Jim McDonald. Uh, Jim McDonald does amazing tour plant tours. Yeah. I love Jim's stuff. Yeah. Lots of good ones. Doug Elliott does some fun things. Doug Elliott. Yeah. <laughs> Cascade, Anderson Geller is no longer with us. And she, we have her uh, uh, plant walk. So yeah, that's that's one of my favorite sections. I want to do more of those. I I um I think once we figure out how we we can interact and do things in the future here, I gotta get back uh, on the road and visit some people's gardens and do some uh, video tours. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. I thought about getting like you know like get one of those like three sixty cameras and do like a like a whole like interactive kind of tour thing. That uh -huh. would be cool. Be but just really any excuse for me to buy more cameras is really. Totally the thing. <laughs> I, I just need to justify more camera equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so cool. Oh, thanks, Anna. Recently upped her membership, and that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have yeah. lots of new stuff on there. We're um, featuring uh, Cultivating Wellness, which is a medicinal herb gardening to course right now. That's on there, too, which is fun. And these courses on Urban you know, they're not like these long uh, courses that'll take you forever. They're just like short things to kind of infuse some knowledge that you can just put right to work. That's the whole concept, you know, as opposed to a more in-depth course. It's like, you know, just enough to get you going. 
<laughs> and then talk about it in the forum. That's the idea. It's like having experiences, ask some questions, share mm -hmm. some wins. I think one of the best ways to learn about herbs is to teach other people. And so we provide that environment for people. And that's how Rosalie, you know, Rosalie started learning. Like you used to, 12 years ago, you started just sharing in the forum. And if you didn't know the information, you'd go look it up and then you'd go share it. And then, then you took more courses and whatnot. And here you are two books later. So, you know, it's been an interesting journey <laughs> watching uh, your process, but just immersing yourself. And, you know, that's the way to do it. Um, do you know about mouse eared chickweed and that can be used in recipes in the same way as common chickweed? Asks Laura. I feel like I can't answer that with 100% mm. certainty. I think people yeah. do use it similarly, but I would really want to check in on that. It doesn't grow near me. So, um, yeah. I see it and I I um I guess anytime I've seen mouse ear chickweed, I've been like, well, there's non-mouse weed chickweed over here. I'm just gonna pick that one. <laughs> and so I haven't bothered to <laughs> find out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good question though. Yeah. <laughs> um is I there mean, a mention? Part of the um oh she's commenting on YouTube, but on mm -hmm. the Wild Gravity Facebook group, that'd be a good question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, someone asked about Herb Mentor, does renewal notices, yeah, anytime you're going to expire, we send a renewal notice if you're a yearly subscriber. Yeah. yeah. But if you ever have questions or need help or something's not working, just contact support. Uh, we have a little blue chat bubble on the bottom right of all of our sites. Karen, Lee, Jewel, uh, 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 Tracy. Um, Karen, Lee, Jewel, and Tracy. I think that's that's the team. Um, yeah. And Karen just mentioned that Kimberly uh -huh. did do a live from her garden for the Herb Fairies Facebook group. I want to go. Watch she that. did, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we should do another tour because it keeps changing. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. For the we're doing a webinar uh, on herb gardening in. Um, you're going to see information about it go out next week and it's going to be showing next Thursday and Friday. It's called how to start growing your own medicine and if you're on the learning herbs list. Uh, we'll be sending you info about that. Yeah. Or I guess on the Facebook page too, we'll be put posting that there too. Uh, do we cover Thai herbs? No, but do we, I don't know. No, we, we haven't. But uh, we've done herbs from other areas. Usually it requires Rosalie traveling there and mm -hmm. then doing videos. I'd love um, to <laughs> Karen, yeah. hi, Karen. Uh, she's wondering if poppy, papavar seeds are edible, and they definitely are. That's, you know, the papavar somniferum seeds. That's what you find on, like, bagels. Um, and I mentioned that lemon balm cake. I put lemon, I put um, poppy seeds in that cake, too. So, mm. and we have actually on the blog years ago, I did a poppy seed kind of like nougat recipe. And in there, I talked a lot about poppy seeds. So if you go to learningherbs.com and go to the blog and then just do a search for poppy, I'm sure it'll come up. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, this is the point in the, in the live where we're just looking for a couple last questions and, um, been on a little over an hour, hour and 10 minutes. And just to make sure, uh, Karen's uh, behind the scenes there has said a couple of times, if you do have any questions about anything, learning herbs or events are related, if you have had any technical issues or not getting certain things, just, just contact us and we'll investigate that for you. Cause uh, there's, there's uh, we have to talk to you personally about that. Um, and let's see, I think that's, uh, so okay to eat, California poppy petals and use them to decorate cakes. Good question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. We have them growing all over right now. They're all just blooming everywhere now. I've taken some pretty epic photos of California poppies in Fort Townsend. It's yeah. Incredible. yeah. They're weeds. So are so are calendula. Calendula is a weed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like there's no shortage of uh calendula. Uh there's a lot of great things blooming now. Hawthorne flowers are abundant and roses are just roses. starting. I saw my first roses today. So I'm pretty mm. excited about that. So I've been stocking up on honey so I can make rose petal honey. This strange looking 
liquid in here is actually a soda that Kimberly made with Hawthorne and rose petals. So she made it with fresh rose petals and Hawthorne flowers, and it is a great soda. She's not eating sugar right now, so I'm drinking all of it because, you know, and it's great. I love when she makes stuff that treats that, that work uh, that I can just eat, drink, and then have all to myself. Um, but that's actually, she's doing a lot of fun experiments for a book that's coming out next year. Um, <clears throat> and so I've been, uh, yeah. Oh, and she made this great rose syrup. It's like a rose. And she did this combination thing that I've never had seen before. And you have to ask her about it. And I just put a little in like some sparkling water. So good. Mm. It's like, get that. It's like the best rose soda ever. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah, stuff. King oxymels or shrubs, which is basically like a vinegar honey herb mixture, and then putting that in sparkling water mm. is like instant soda that you make yourself. So delicious. I go through a lot of my soda streams right now. Someone's asking about the um uh the live we did in our kitchen if that video is available. Um, I don't know how easy it would be to find down the feed on the learning herbs Facebook page, but if you go to the um YouTube, go to the Her Herb Mentor is the page, not Learning Herbs. And that's just because of some weird thing that happened years ago where someone took the name Learning Herbs and I couldn't, so I used Herb Mentor, so I just did it that way. Uh, but if you look on the Herb Mentor YouTube channel, I, I, I put it public. It should be it should be viewable there on YouTube. Just look for like YouTube, I guess, slash Herb Mentor. I don't know. Like You'll, you'll figure it out. Just <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, yeah. Um, we have some good questions here that we can just finish up with these. Um, well, first, Liana says, I'm jealous. We're just waking up plants here in Minnesota. You know, kind of the other day, I was wishing I could just like redo spring again, because spring is so beautiful. And it just here it kind of like starts like almost achingly slow. Like I'm just so excited for everything to come out. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, man, I can't yeah. even keep up. So I'm at that stage now where everything's happening so fast that I kind of wish I could like do a reset. So my uh, advice to you, is uh, unsolicited advice. <laughs> it's just to enjoy every second of it. And um, I'm kind of jealous of you that you have that spring ahead of you. Um, so let's see, there were some other questions. Oh, here, Katrina says, how do you tell which roses are medicinal and which are decorative? Are any domesticated roses medicinal? Well, in terms of the roses I like to use, I like to use wild roses and roses that smell pretty. And so what I mean by wild roses is roses that haven't been hybridized. So they have five petals. Um, some, there are some hybridized roses that have only five petals, but um, mm -hmm. generally those five petal roses are the ones that smell really good. There are some hybridized roses that also smell really good. And I would use those too. If a rose doesn't smell, it might still have medicinal properties. I don't know because I don't use them, but I'm also kind of like the reason why I, I use them mostly is for the smell. So if they don't have a smell, I'm just kind of not really interested in them personally. The one rose that I would not use is anything that's been sprayed and things that, you know, if, if they're growing in your yard, obviously, you know, if they've been sprayed or anything. The other thing is that florist roses, those are just horrific, really. I mean, if you get them from like a, not like your local flower farmer who doesn't spray, but if you get them from you know, major florist areas, those are generally grown in these, you know, huge greenhouses uh, all across the world. There's lots of documentation about just the horrible conditions, the workers there, and they just get heavily sprayed with all sorts of garbage. So you never want to use those. Um, but other than that, you know, that's like the big no, don't use something that's been sprayed. Uh, other than that, you could use something that doesn't have a smell. But for me, I, I like to stick to the things with the smell. Then Rebecca says, do you put the whole rose petals in the honey? And yes, I put whole rose petals. I don't put the sepals or the ovary. Um, you know, it's just the petals uh, in the honey. And oh, it's so good. Rose petal honey. Um, we make a lot of that every year. And um, I actually just gave um, a couple little, they make wonderful gifts, right? Because honey, rose. I love that it's also like can be entirely local. I get the honey from a beekeeping friend and mix it with the rose petals makes a lovely gift. I just gifted some to friends for Mother's Day who are missing out on seeing their kids as usual for Mother's Day because their kids live far away and they couldn't travel here because of um, the pandemic. So gave them a little little bit of rose to, to brighten their day. Um, hmm. I'm yeah. trying to see if we have in the search uh, 
in learning herbs in the blog, I'm just putting rose honey in and, um, yeah, there's a herbal honey recipe right there that, uh, that you could check out, to see how that's made. Just type rose honey in the search bar in the learning herbs blog. Yeah, and I have um, a lot of information about roses in there too, how to make it, but also kind of all the stuff we've been talking about. I have one question I'd like to finish up on here, if that's okay, Rosalie. I had one more, okay. I don't know, the same one. It's really quick. Go Lori ahead. says, don't they use poppy petals for other things like illegal things? Uh, the poppy plant, the po um, Popover somniferum is used, um, can be used as a drug, but what they're using there is the sap from the poppy plant. So it's not the petals. And that's a very particular species, the California poppy, uh, the corn poppies that grow all over France. Those are not used in a similar way. And the petals are definitely not used that way. So just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure. So it didn't sound like I was like recommending somebody decorate their cakes with something that might be intoxicating. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right. What is the one you want to end up, boss? Oh, um, well, uh, I just thought we'd add one, which would be a segue to next week, which is I either ask, I live in an apartment. How can I grow herbs in that environment? And um, this is just a uh, cliffhanger we're going to leave you off on because uh, Sue Kush is a gardener who did a course inside of Herb Mentor called Cultivating Wellness. If you're Herb Mentor member, you can watch it anytime. Uh, but we're going gonna to um, talk about, um, you know, herbs and uh starting herbs and propagating and and uh start to teach you techniques uh through our webinar and then our course which really are for anywhere including um including uh containers so that would be the answer containers and then uh sue has a plan and talks about soil and talks about lots of stuff in cultivating wellness that will kind of get you started in that area and i think she she comes on the forum on herb mentor yeah she does. And um, she's written other, she just wrote an article for Herb Mentor on how to grow your own hedge row, which mm -hmm. was really good. I just read that the other day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go to Sue for gardening advice. And she actually wrote the gardening sections within Wild Remedies. So we got outside help for that. Oh, and, uh, yes. I go to for gardening. She knows her stuff. So I'm looking forward to that webinar next week. And yeah. Next week, we're going to focus on gardening for a little bit. And then, uh, now we got some, we got a new thing we got to start working on because it's coming out sometime in the summer and it's different than anything else we've done. And we're very excited about it, but we can't tell you about it yet, but we like to surprise everybody. So we're not going to give anything away. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Rosalie, that everyone is watching. I really appreciate taking some of your time today on Wednesday to join us. We like to come on here on Herb Mentor Live. We call it Herb Mentor Live because of our awesome site, Herb Mentor, which you can join anytime. Start it for a dollar. You can go on Learning Herbs or HerbMentor.com and read about it and um, and join there. And Rosalie, thank you for taking your time today. Appreciate it. Oh, pleasure. I'm just so glad that people came because, you know, at one o'clock, nobody was here and it was very sad. Oh, and then they showed up. With it. everybody here. So I really appreciate it. Thanks for all your well, questions sure. and enthusiasm. And and thanks to uh, Karen and Lee again uh, behind the scenes. And we'll be back doing this again in the future. But meanwhile, we'll see you over on the forum on Herb Mentor. And uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And we'll be back. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great, great afternoon. <laughs>